interview with Steve Reeves, um, I would like to you know, dedicate it obviously to all Steve's fans and also to Ivan Dunbar, who was a great help uh, in helping us organize it at the time. And the chap in the interview with me is Tony Quinn. And right. Tony is a former Mr. Ireland, Mr. Dublin, Mr. Leinster, and uh, probably one of the most successful business people and yoga people in, in Ireland at the moment. Okay. So him and I became good friends over the years. Okay. And then um, the chances of, it was suggested many, many times that, you know, maybe could we get a chance to meet the great Steve Reeves? Yeah. And I said, I would love to do that. Okay. And, uh, so I spoke to Ivan Dunbar and I said to Ivan, is there any chance of us getting a meet and greet with, with, with Steve Reeves? Because he was coming to London to the Hall of Fame Awards. And uh, Ivan then made a few phone calls to Malcolm Wyatt from NABA. And we went over and we were having dinner and uh, Steve was at the table and I sort of said to him, he had been sort of told about it by, by Ivan that we were going to ask him anyway. So I said, Steve, listen, we are huge fans and I would give anything if we possible to have a, you know, an interview with you. I said, I brought over a, a film crew from Ireland. I had a sound engineer and I had a cameraman. And uh, I said, you know, we're going to be setting up in a room, we say 56. And I said, it would be an honor if we got an opportunity just to talk to you even for 20 minutes mm -hmm. um, about your life and about your training. It would be a great honor for us. And um, so we sort of left it at that. And then we went up to the room. And after the dinner was over, we were sitting there. And next of all, this tap on the door comes. And, I <laughs> open the door, and there is God standing There's in front God of There's God right there. And so said, what year was this, Pat? 1990? I think 1994. 94, okay. Yeah. And um, he, he sort of looked at me and when I said, oh, it's God. And he sort of laughed and sort of said, now, I'm not quite God, but I mean, you know, I said, listen, to us, you're a God. You're, you know, the reason I have a beard is because of you, Steve Reeves. I wanted to be, I wanted to be Hercules like you. And then Tony, he couldn't believe it either. So, uh, so what was him, your, what was your first, when somebody that you meet, you're brand new, there's usually not always, but there's a charisma, there's an energy, there's something almost magical about people like that. Did you feel anything like that with Steve? Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. We, we felt, we also, I felt a great connection with him and so did Tony because we just related to him really well because he knew you that can we tell, weren't. You can tell that when you watch this interview, he seems like he feels very comfortable with you guys. There's a twinkle. Well, for someone that he hadn't met before, we, yeah. we hadn't, he'd never spoken to him and he probably was expecting the normal stupid questions that people ask him. And I think he was taken back by our questions, which were much more normal as if we were having a chat with somebody and they weren't contrived and they weren't trying to catch him out to be, you know, taking drugs or whatever. And, uh, we found that he just sat there and he just relaxed and he could have gone on for forever, except I think his girlfriend or wife was waiting. I think Deborah was with him down at that time. Mm -hmm. I think she was waiting on him. And, um, it was just an amazing experience. I mean, we, I don't know, to have that interview then, I gave Ivan Dunbar a copy of it because he was so good to us. So I have the originals on, on Betamax tape. And um, I said to Ivan, we should try and do something with this. And then, unfortunately, over the years, he died. And his daughter then was, was involved in NABA, which I met. So they, they awarded me the, the Hall of Fame for... Um, you know, in the, for being in the, in the industry for so long and, and being an ambassador to whatever. So they had a presentation by Dorian Yates to me saying, you know, uh, the Hall of Fame, Pat Henry, and so, which was really nice. And Ivan's daughter was there and we spoke about it. So other than that, this documentary that you're going to see or this interview, um, it is a first. And I think it will be fascinating for anybody to, who has, is a fan of Steve to, to see this. Well, thank you for so graciously, Pat, letting us see this because I've watched it now three times and it is absolutely probably the best piece I've ever seen on Steve. The filming, the lighting, the questioning, it's just a feel good piece. So I'm so honored and, and thankful that you're letting us release this to the rest of the world. But what I liked about the interview was is that he was so into it himself mm -hmm. and you can see that when you're listening to it or watching it he just relaxes as if we're having a chat 
And uh, I think the question is like, um, I remember asking him about how he kept his waist so small because when I was competing in the contests, m- my target was to get my waist to 28. And, and you I had a, it. I've seen pictures of you. You have a small waist. Oh, I, got it, I got it to 27 and three quarters. Wow. And uh, I wanted to be, I, want, I always remember that the, the thing he said was, don't do too many sit-ups. Don't do side bends to widen your obliques. Keep, you know, every exercise you do is going to get your stomach. And as Vince said, you know, the abdominals come from your diet, not from the exercise. And so for those of you watching this, if you don't know already, Pat was manager at Vince Garanda's gym for a period of time. So that's why we're mentioning Vince right now. Pat is just an amazing guy. He trains celebrities, politicians, athletes. He's in Dublin, Ireland. The list goes on and on and on. So uh, what an opportunity to, to speak with you and to hear firsthand your interview you know, your experience with Steve. So during this interview, the viewer is going to see some dead time and we can't hear what's being said. Is this where you guys were talking about how to keep your waist small? Well, we were just talking about the diet, believe it or not. We asked him about the, uh, his food intake and anybody who has read your stuff on Vince or on, on Steve will know he talks about his diet and how he was eating his five small meals a day and he was eating fruit and he was eating some goats, taking some goat's milk and so on. So that you can get that. That's basically what was happening at the end. And okay. we thought the camera was still rolling, but it wasn't still rolling, which is a pity. But look, we have, I think, about 45 minutes of it, which is uh, right. fantastic. Right. But the guy doing the interview with me, I might mention it as well, was Tony Quinn and myself. So Tony is uh, the first part of it, and I did the second part of it. And uh, believe it or not, we didn't have the questions written out. <laughs> That's amazing. And so like when, it, when the viewer watches this, they're going to be blown away by that because it seems like you guys, you are, you're very well prepared. And no, we seems, no research. No, wow. we, well, the only research we had was what we would love to ask him. Right. And but so the so, fact... The fact that you're so composed, because a lot of people in front of Steve Reeves would just completely lose their composure. And yeah. then to be able to ask these questions that are very targeted, that are the questions we all would probably want to ask is amazing. Well, we asked to ask them as a fan, not as a journalist. I think that was the difference that when you're able to say whatever, how did you keep your way small? Or as Tony said to him, like, what was your blueprint for living? Yeah. Like I thought that was an interesting question because right. I've never heard body but has been asked those questions before. Absolutely right. And I'm taking notes, you know, while I'm hearing Steve talk about this. And, you know, that's I, I had never really heard, you know, that part of Steve's philosophy, at least not yeah. in that great a detail. So what was Tony's what is Tony's background, just so we don't skip over him? Well, he was uh, he is uh, probably the most um, knowledgeable yoga teacher that you're ever going to meet. And he's a he's a very successful businessman now who lives in Paradise Island in the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. And, nice. um, he has shops here and he's, he's involved in a gym's chain called the Duco. Uh, but he uh, we, we, we were just big fans and the type of training we did um, would have been based on Steve's type of training, mm-hmm. always aiming for the high pecs. Mm-hmm. And like when he was competing, he never took any drugs at all. No. Uh, he was in, again, the measurements would be 18 and a half inch arm, 8 and a half inch calf, 8 and a half inch neck, you know, 50 inch chest, 30 inch waist. And that was the proportions that we would aim for. Right. So I trained with him for a long time uh, when, when we came back from California. And uh, we opened up a gym then in, in, in Dublin together. But in the end, it was time for me to move on and do my own thing. Right. I opened my place and he then went on to to do his, his business programs. He does a lot of wellness programs for a lot of, um, you know, business people. And, and mm-hmm. uh, but it was just at the time, it was great that we were able to get together to do that interview because, um, as I said, nobody else had the opportunity, right. took the opportunity to do it. Well, I just like to, to see that. And now it's finally getting out there to all the Steve Reeves fans. And, um, it, it just, we, it'll be great to see it in, 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 you know, I haven't seen it now in a good while. I haven't even seen it for years. So I can't remember some of it, but I'm, I must watch it myself. But um, it'll be great. I think a lot of people are going to really, really like it. And it will be a premiere, I think. And what I like about it is the quality is so good. Right. Like, it's, yeah. it's very clear. The, right. the, the vocals are very clear. Where a lot of stuff I've seen of Vince, it's somebody sticking a microphone in his face and talking, like, and the camera work is very hazy. And what I, I think the one you have there now, I think, I think people are going to be blown away by it. I agree. 
Well, Pat, thank you so much for once again, so graciously allowing us to view this. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. If there's anything else, like if you want people to somehow be able to contact you, I can put that below the video. Or if you want to tell well, them now, it's up to you. Well, my email is pathenrywellness at gmail.com in Dublin. And that's, that's, that's really it. But um, if, if you want anything else, then just give me a shout and we'd be delighted to have a chat. And, you know, the story continues, but we're not dead yet, as the rock and roll band says. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, there you go. There's my uh, interview with Pat Henry. And you're about to see the Steve Reeves interview that, as far as we know, has never been seen. Oh, it's never been seen by anybody. Enjoy, guys. This is Scott York for Pat Henry. You guys have a great day. Yeah, okay. Okay, Steve. What I want to find out from you is, what would your blueprint for a living actually be? Well, I would say, uh, make, we'll say make a five-year plan of what you really desire in life, what you want to achieve, and then outline everything in detail, how you plan to do it, uh -huh. and try to stick with it. Yeah. And you can change it, modify it a little bit as you go along if it's not working too well. But stick with it, stick with it. Right. You only fail if you stop. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And what part do you think that the mental attitude plays? We just say in your actual training, even in, in the weight training or sticking mm -hmm. to a diet or even being successful in the movies? I think it has a great lot of, great amount of, to do with it because yeah. uh, mm -hmm. you have to really concentrate on what you're doing. And uh, if, if your mental attitude is, isn't right, you, you can't go through it, whether it's remembering your lines in the movies, whether it's concentrating on uh, doing your exercises when you work out, if you're a little tired, you concentrate a little deeper, you exercise a little longer. When I exercise, it's almost like a hypnotic trance I go into. Right, sure. I picture the muscle I'm working. I don't picture the weight going up and down. <clears throat> I picture the muscle I'm working. I picture it growing, you see. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It seemed to work for me. Right, right. And would you lift very heavy weights to do this? Do you know what I mean? How much mind over matter is it? I, I think it's a, it's a great deal of mind over matter. You, you, you must really... Uh, Think deeply and concentrate on what you're doing. You have to picture something happening before it happens. Right, right. If you can't conceive it, you can't achieve it. Right, yeah. That's mm, my philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so you would nearly have visualized the type of physique you, right. you, yes, you I wanted. Would. Right. I yeah. visualize how the muscle should look while I'm doing the exercise. And maybe in my spare time, if, just before I go to sleep or something like that, at that time, I would visualize really? what I want it to be. That's very interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And you would really do this all the time you, you were yes, seriously training. that's right, right. I mean, would you do that as it is now? I mean, would you, would you still continue to do that, or would that just be just when you were training for contest? That's when I was training for a contest, trying to achieve something, a certain goal. Yeah. After you achieve that goal, you can just relax and go to something else, or you don't have to be so intense. Right, yeah, yeah. And how about for, in, in, say, on a film, would you, would you apply your mind much for a film? W would that be necessary? Well, I would apply my mind for a film, <coughs> concentrating on uh, learning the lines, yeah. and uh, figuring how I'm going to do them and where I'm going to walk and what I'm going to do, all, all those different things. The director doesn't necessarily help you. He only tells you when you're wrong right. when you're doing yeah. a film. He lets yeah. you usually go on your own. And if something is wrong, then he'll say, well, this isn't quite working. And he'll say, do a little bit more like this or whatever. And the most frustrating thing on doing films, sometimes you might do a scene that you really thought was great and yeah. The, yeah. the crew around you, the cameraman, the electrician, ac afterwards they applaud. And then you find out that there was a fly in front of the camera, or an airplane went over, or the person you were talking to made the wrong gesture while you were talking to them. I mean, that's really disheartening when you've done yeah, something that you really felt was yeah. good and everybody yeah. else felt was good, yeah. it'll never be on the camera. Right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And um, what, what would your be now in general? What would your philosophy of life be? Right now? Y no, just in general throughout right, your right. life, or has it changed much uh, as you found as you, as you went through life? Well, I always tried to concentrate on living a healthy life yeah. uh, and keeping it free from stress. Stress is a killer. You really think this is important? Yeah. Oh, yes, right, yeah. right. Yeah. If I have to do an engagement of some kind, I, I think, how much money am I getting? How much stress is it going to cause me? And I balance the two. Really? That's very right. interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And you feel this is important in staying healthy? Yeah, I, I think so, right. To live yeah. a long, healthy life, you must keep the stress level very low. Yeah. Happiness level <coughs> high and the stress level low. <laughs> in, in one of your interviews, you said that uh, your ambition at one time was to be the healthiest man in the world. 
Well, no, I want to live to be 100. Yeah. Because if I don't make it, it might be bad for my reputation. <laughs> 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 well, do you feel that you, you achieved being the healthiest man in the world? I mean, well, a lot I of people you see. I'm healthy as I want to be. Right, right. I, I haven't had any troubles in my life. Right. Always yeah. been very healthy and vigorous. And yeah. Lots of energy. Yeah. Wake up in the morning. Sometimes I wake up with so, so much energy I want to go turn a car over. I never do it. but I <laughs> Really? <laughs> really. Yeah. Yes, right. And do you think that's hereditary or do you think it's your lifestyle? It could be inherited from my father. He was uh, my height and my weight and my build that I, I am today really? w without ever working out. Of course, I, uh, when I was in championship form, yeah. that, w that was in addition to my genetics. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is it true that you were an only child? Is that true? Yeah, my father got killed when I was 20 months old. Right. And you're the only one in right. the family? Yes, I was the first child and my father got killed when I was 20 months old. Right. Yeah. So I don't really know my father. I just see pictures of him and hear a lot of stories about him. Right. I remember seeing a picture when he was uh, 12 years old, chopping down a tree in Minnesota. He had shoulders about this wide. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and how come, Steve, that you never produced your own courses? Everyone I know wanted those courses. Well, there, there, there's, there's been so many courses out that I thought would do, just be one more book on, on the never. bookshelf. You know? Never. <laughs> never. So I, I just never got around to it. And when I got when I did the power walking book, and yeah. I thought, well, maybe somebody said, why don't you do on bodybuilding too? And I thought, well, I'm past my prime in bodybuilding, so I, I didn't want to just uh, have somebody else take pictures in my book. You see what I mean? So it was partially that too. In other words, I, I'm in great shape for my age, but I have a little age on me. That, that's the point. You see what I mean? So uh, but nobody's getting any younger <laughs> anyway. No, what, I'm, what, I'm try, what I'm trying to say is. Uh, if I were taking the pictures, we'll say at 25 yeah. or 30, that was my ideal shape at that time. They'd be more inspirational to the readers than if I had done them at 60, you see what I mean? But, but, but surely if someone is in good shape at 60, that says much more for the lifestyle right. than being in good shape at 20. I know that, but 20-year-old <laughs> but uh, bodybuilders don't think that, you know? No. When a person will say it's 40, 50, they'll say, hey, I want to look like that when I'm 60 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I would have to maybe direct it to the older set but I don't like to limit myself to that. Yeah, well, no, it's hard for me to conceive that because, for instance, there's so many people that today, when they look at your pictures, they think, oh, that's it, you know, that's mm -hmm. the way I'd like to look if it were mm -hmm. possible. Of course, it's generally not possible, mm -hmm. but if you were to maybe write training courses and give some advice on exactly mm -hmm. how you did the training, mm -hmm. I think it would be probably the best seller in bodybuilding ever. Nah, I, I don't know. Really? You know, there's been so many, uh, like I say, books put out, and so many courses, and yeah. so many thoughts on bodybuilding that it's probably all been said now. Yeah, but there's only one Steve Reeves. <laughs> Thank you. No, seriously, I mean, because everybody w w would be interested mm -hmm. in what you'd have to say there. They're always collecting little bits and pieces, and well, I no, nobody's how I really asked work. me to seriously. No publisher said, "Hey, let's get together and and uh, do a book on bodybuilding." Right. Uh, yeah. 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 You know that chap Moore, he bought out this, this book on you. I mean, mm -hmm. I have two copies right. of it, for instance. Well, you have two of them. Huh? Yeah, and that, that was a great seller altogether, as far as I know. Oh, yeah, it was. He in, in, fact, in, in fact, people write to me today and say, I want to copy that book. They send me the money, yeah. and yeah. I have to make out an envelope, send them the money back. I say, this book is out of print and uh, out of stock. And for the last four or five years, they've been writing me, asking me about it. Right, yeah. But yeah. Uh, I, I guess I'll try to get him to reprint it again or something. And you don't think you could be persuaded to, to write your bodybuilding course? I, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> you of all people. Hmm. How many films did you make all together? Uh, 17. 17. Uh, 15, which I starred in. Right, right. And what was Jailbait your first one? Yeah, it was originally called The Hidden Face of my first film. Right. That's where I got my Screen Actors Guild union card. Right, yeah. doing that part there. Yeah, yeah. And then Athena was my second. And uh, then Hercules, and after Hercules, I didn't <coughs> know how I was going to do on the, do on the box office. Yeah. So I came back and it, I took a regular job again right. for a while as a public relations for this health studio. And then six months later, they said, well, it's, it's doing real good. Come on over and make, make another one. So when I got in the middle of the second one, I, w I had signed up for the third and fourth. When I got in the third one, I had signed up for the fifth and sixth. So right. I always had two to go every yeah. Yeah. from then on after, after the public had seen it. Right. And my first film, Hercules, was not only the biggest box office in the world, it was the biggest box office in the States also. Yeah. I outgrossed John Wayne and Rock Hudson and all the people who were the biggest stars at that time. So I, I think it's for somebody make, starring in their first film to yeah. be the best box office in the world, 
Oh, that was quite an achievement. I read at the time it even outgrows Bridget Bardal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I could have, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. And what was your last film? It was a Western called A Long Ride from Hell. Right. I, uh, I was the, uh, the star, the co-author, the technical director, and that, that was about it. That was, that, was, that was stressful. Now that was stressful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the only time in my life I thought I was going to get sick doing all those three things together, you know. Right, right. right. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, the production, sometimes they would have a scene where I would ride into, into town on a black horse with a brown saddle and shoot him up or whatever and ride out, out of town. And it was shot a different day, the riding out of town. But they had me on, and on a brown horse with a black saddle, just the opposite. I said, no, no, we can't shoot this. <laughs> uh, we have to shoot something else because I was being the technical director. So I said, we have to uh, change that, and uh, tomorrow night we have to shoot the scene again. Because you can't do that. A guy comes into town on a black horse and a brown saddle and goes out on a brown horse and a black <laughs> saddle. It just doesn't work, you know? Was it true that you, you were offered the, the films that Clint Eastwood did, the, the Fistful of Dollars? Yes, and all I, I was, right. I was That's really that. true, a true yeah, story. It's true, right. And yeah. I thought to myself, how can an Italian director and uh, shoot a Western film? You know, I, you know I'm, I'm a man of the West. I was born in Montana. Right. All my uncles are cowboys. They have big ranches and things like that. So I'm, I'm a Western cowboy type of person. And so I wanted to represent that uh, the way it should be. Right. So I thought, yeah. how can an Italian director do a picture like that based up on a Japanese film? You know, yeah. that was based on that uh, sa samurai picture yeah. Yeah. of the Japanese director, Kiyosawa, right. I think, like that. Right. So I thought, how could that be? So I, I turned it down, right? <laughs> <laughs> and were you sorry after as you turned it down, or did you really not care at the end of it all? Well, it, it would have been nice, <laughs> but I, 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 I wouldn't have been the character. I, I wouldn't have been the character who go around smoking a cigar because I, I don't believe in, in advertising unhealthy things like that. Right. So yeah. I wouldn't have done it that way anyway. So it might not have had the same impact. No, I, I, th I think some people are, are made for certain roles. Right. Like Clint Eastwood was perfect for that. Stallone was perfect for Rocky. Yeah. I was perfect for Hercules. Each right. person is perfect for a different part yeah. and always be remembered for that no matter what they do. Right. Well, that's so true, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. as I said, when I went into that shop in London, the first thing he says is Steve Reeves, Hercules. Right. That's right. That's Immediately. Right. That's right. Sure. Yeah. Which is really... So why would you think, though, that you, you create such an impression that would last so long? You know the way there's been other bodybuilders and everyone said at the time, oh, they were wonderful. but. They're virtually unknown today. Well, I don't really know. Maybe, maybe it's because I had a very symmetrical physique, accompanied by, we'll say, a, a noble face. Yeah. And yeah. maybe that's a good combination. And you think that's what it was? It, it may have been. Yeah. I, I have no yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. Maybe it's a certain aura you give up, a certain look you have yeah. in the eye. Yeah. We don't know what those things are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes the camera will pick up something, and sometimes it won't. You see a person uh, that you talk to on the street or something like that, and you see a lot of potential. You put yeah. it in front of the camera, there's, there's a screen there. It doesn't catch it. Yeah, yeah. Other people look like there's not much personality there, but the screen picks up something so. that's there, right? Yeah, yeah. And what would you think about the kind of Michelin man look that the bodybuilders have today? You know, kind of homes, bumps, bumps. What would you think of that? Oh, I, I think it's overdone. Yeah, yeah. You see, uh, I believe in proportion. Right. Every, yeah. every man is born with a certain size head and certain size hands. Yeah. When you get your bicep looking bigger than your head, it, it's no longer proportion. No, it's ridiculous. No, not at all. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So there's nothing beautiful about no, that. No, no, no. Nothing beautiful, nothing yeah. athletic about it. Yeah. Symmetry and portion, proportion were what I was yeah. achieving. And is it true that you based your measurements upon Michelangelo's statue of David? Was that just something? No, just his, uh, <coughs> his, his uh, assumption that a person should have the same size neck, calves, and arms. Right. That was it. Yeah. And it seemed to work out. I, I mean, I've seen other bodybuilders who achieved that, and they look great. Right. What, what was the biggest you ever were? I mean, did you ever go beyond that, or did you no, say, No, I got 18 and a quarter inch arms, calves and neck, 52 inch chest, 29 inch waist. That was it. I, I wanted to achieve a 24 inch difference between chest and waist. I couldn't right. get it. I got 23, then I started going to the movies. I also wanted to get 24. Uh, width between shoulder to shoulder with outside calipers. Right. Across, I got 23 yeah. and a half inches arm yeah. and tendon. He measured me once, but I. You see, if I would have had another six months bodybuilding, I could have got another inch on my chest, and another half inch on my shoulders, and I would achieved everything I ever wanted in life. That's the only two things <laughs> that I didn't achieve that I really wanted to achieve. <laughs> what weight were you were you at that time? Uh, 217. 217. Right. Mm -hmm. and that, was that the heaviest you ever were? Yes, it was. I, I think I went to Miss Universe at 217, 
at Mr. America 213. Mr. America 213. Right. Mm -hmm. um, was it true that when, when, just say when you were going to win the Mr. America, when you'd be going down the beach, that people used to get up and follow you going down the beach? Oh, yes, they did, they did right. Yeah. And yeah. the thing was that uh, a lot of my uh, competitors, the people in the same contest, yeah. uh, they had been bodybuilding for years and had their pictures in every magazine they could for years and years. And I didn't. I didn't want to have a picture taken of me until I was where I thought I should be. Right, yeah, so yeah. nobody had ever seen my pictures in the magazines when the contest was on. Yeah. So I'd walk down the beach and they'd say, who are you? I said, Mr. X. <laughs> 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 so uh, I'd walk down the street and say, the other body, body, body was talking to each other. I'd say, who's this guy that everybody's talking about? I said, yeah. we haven't seen the guy. They call him Mr. X or something like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I did cause a, a big crash there. I was walking down the street there. And this car was looking like this. It didn't hit the corner right. There was a curve and it smashed into another car in a big accident there. <laughs> was, well, it wasn't my fault. I was walking down the street, you know? <laughs> he was so busy looking at you. <laughs> right, right, right. That's incredible uh, because um, I, when I was working as a, in, in one of the gyms, training mm -hmm. the, these people at one stage, and this chap was in from New York, and he said that he was in this play on Broadway with mm -hmm. you, I think. Mm -hmm. But he said that when you'd go into a restaurant, mm -hmm. if people were eating at the time, they'd all stop and they'd all look. He said, you want to see the impression this man has. Mm -hmm. He says it's mm -hmm. untrue. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there are people in this world, you don't know who they are, when they walk in the room, you think they must be somebody. You don't yeah. know who. They could be yeah. a rocket scientist. They could yeah. be anything. They could be an Olympic athlete or whatever. They just have a certain aura about them. You just wonder, he, they, he or she must be somebody. Yeah. Without them trying to act like they're somebody or anything, they're just casually walking in, doing their thing, or having their lunch, or walking down the street, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Did you have any secret to getting this? Every time we saw you in, in the magazines, you had this amazing tan. Did, did you have any secret to do that? Or was, was that just natural, or did you do something? No, we have a lot of sun in California. I used to use cocoa butter. Cocoa butter? Oh, yes, cocoa butter, and I had a little secret. I used to drink carrot juice and raisins. See, carrot juice puts a little bit of orange in your skin. Right. And raisins puts the red in your skin, and so orange and red and, and brown make a great color, from, brown from the sun, really? you see. So it was a combination of the three. Is this the yarn in, in, in the raisins? Yes, yes, right. Fantastic, uh -huh. and, and you found that that's what did it? Right, I found that accidentally. And my drink that I have for breakfast, it has uh, orange juice and gelatin and eggs and a few other things. I, I found out later on that if you just take gelatin, which is about 87% protein, mm -hmm. you can't utilize that protein because it's missing two key amino acids. Right, yeah. And I always took raw eggs with it, and I found out 20 years later that those eggs have the two key amino acids very strong that the uh, uh, gelatin doesn't have. Right. So I, sometimes I've done things in life accidentally that turned out to be scientifically sound. Right. Uh, like when I used to work out, I always used to have a mug of, uh, let's see, what was it? Juice, it was water, lemon juice, and honey together. That's almost like, like their electrolyte drinks they have today for, for athletes, now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have to mix the honey with the lemon to dissolve the honey, then pour water in there. I used to drink maybe a quart or two during my workout, and that would give me all, all the energy. It would alkalize my system. I wouldn't get, my muscles wouldn't, wouldn't get tightened and things like that during the exercise. It wouldn't because of the uh, acid going into them, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. So it, it was a scientific discovery I made myself accidentally. <laughs> Sometimes you, you need yeah, something, yeah. you know. Yeah, right. That's fantastic. I mean, you could have marketed that at the time. Right, you had right. realized it mm -hmm. because everyone. I mean, they're they're selling right. them everywhere now. That's right, today. right. So those two things I just came by accidentally. Right. Yeah. Sometimes I have cravings for things that I found out later were really good for me at the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereabouts are you living at the moment? I live in San Diego County, about one hour north of San Diego. I have a ranch. Right. I have horses, which I ride every day. And I have, oh, maybe 50 avocado trees and 50 orange trees. Sounds ideal. Right, it keeps me busy. Yeah, yeah. Right, it keeps me busy and active. Yeah, and is that what you mainly do at this? Yes, this, this that's right, I'm yeah. retired, that's what I do. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't continually, you don't plan to continually write books or anything Oh, of that no, nature. no, I, I only co-author that one book, Power Walking, that was it. Right, right. There, there, I don't believe there's that much, unless you have a runaway bestseller, there isn't that much money in writing books. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, well, obviously, I, I still think if you, if you brought out those courses, everyone <laughs> would buy them. That's wonderful, Steve. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Indeed. You're welcome. Absolutely Thank you. wonderful. Right, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs>
bit nervous meeting the great man himself <laughs> because as I said, Tony and I have been waiting to meet you for so long. It's a, it's a great, it's a great privilege. Um, these are just a few questions that we would want to try and cover in regards to the, the Nabi universe, mm -hmm. and, and we follow on from that. Like, what are your what are your own thoughts and reflections on your visit to the Missy universe? You know, in 1948 versus John Grimmick, and then in mm -hmm. 1950 with Raj Park. Well, let's see. In, in 48, I went over there and hoping that I would win, uh, but didn't think I w would because I hadn't uh, trained for a while, because under contract about three or four months before to C.C. Billy Mill to play the part of Samson in Samson Delilah, and he asked me to lose some weight. So I lost about 10 pounds, and <clears throat> I didn't get the contract uh, for good because they wanted to use Victor Mature because he had been in the films for a longer time, and I hadn't lost enough weight. He wanted me to lose 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. I lost about 12, and he wanted me to lose 20, so he said, you're not cooperating. We'll have to cancel the contract. So I went over there under what I wanted to be, but uh, so I didn't expect to win. So coming uh, second to great John Grimmick was uh, a, a po bonus, a plus for me, because he was one of the few people that uh, we boys of that age admired. I was only 22 at the time, and uh, from the age of 16, I've been seeing his pictures in the magazines and looking at him and saying, well, I wish I could have arms like that, I wish I had legs sure. like that. And what about Reg Park in 1950? Well, at Reg Park in 1950, I had seen pictures of Reg. I knew he would be a formidable competitor. And uh, I didn't know about that one either because I only had one month of training before that one. But uh, I came along pretty well. And uh, one strange thing, some Englishman uh, gave, uh, donated the trophy for Mr. Universe. It was a statue of Eugene Sandow that Sandow had actually had on his own desk at, at the time. So he wanted to make sure it went to an Englishman. So he, he thought, well, Red Park was going to win that year. He thought he was safe. You know, he knew I was trying to be in the movies and hadn't trained for a year or two. Uh, and so I w was lucky enough to win that one. That was great. But Red was a fierce competitor. He was great. So you have good memories of that contest? Oh, yes, sure. yes, yes. And what sort of shape do you think you were in at that time, at that 1950 universe? Well, you was, would you say this one of your best? Uh, yes, prob best probably shape? close to the best I've ever been. And what would your measurements roughly have been at the time of that? Oh, I would say uh, arms, calf, and, uh, and neck, 18 and a quarter. Each of them. And your waist? 29, <coughs> chest 52. You see, I always wanted to have a 24-inch difference between the waist and chest. I got a 23-inch difference, but I didn't make the 24 because, you know, I tried to get in the movies and things like that because there was no money in, in bodybuilding. Sure. I mean, there, there still isn't except for the very chosen few. And how did you manage to get your waist so small? This is one thing. No, I, I just kept it that small. In other words, it was always that small as a boy, and, and when I started putting on muscle, it went other places, because I, I didn't work the waistline. At all? The muscles only went where I worked them. Oh, and I, I was lucky because uh, when I started at 16 and a half years old, I was six foot tall and weighed 163 and worked out for a month and just hardened up for that month. Then the following month, I put on uh, 10 pounds to 173. The following month, another 10 pounds to 183, all solid muscle. The next month, 193. So in actually three months, I gained 30 pounds of solid muscle, and the waist hadn't gone up a centimeter. Uh, but it took me a whole year to get from 193 uh, to 23. Then I went in the army. And would that have been eating a lot more food, obviously, than what you were normally Oh, eating? yes, yes. I eating a lot more food, getting a lot more rest. So what would you normally eat to bulk up now, to keep your waist that small? Well, I, I don't know. I, I would just eat normal meals, I thought. Oh. I guess they're double for some people. <laughs> but did you keep away from the fat in the, in the diet, or did you just... No, not in those days. We didn't know about that. In, in fact, my trainer said, drink a lot of half and half. You know, uh, but I, I, I didn't. I just drank ma regular milk. And but they were they were bucking up on half and half. But your training must have been very hard. And oh, uh, my training was very intense. Yeah. Very concentrated. Very intense. So how I long would you train for? Uh, two and a half hours, uh, three days a week. But I mean, really intense. I mean, just almost hypnotic. And you reckon that's part of the success of? Oh yes, oh, sure. Getting the muscles to where you want them. That's right. In other words, I didn't, I knew, I didn't uh, have any uh, limitations. I didn't know it was difficult to gain that much muscle in a short time. I looked at the pictures of the guys in the magazine and thought, why not? I didn't know it was difficult. So nobody told me it was difficult, so it wasn't, you see. How would you sort of contrast the period um, back then with today? Like, after all, you're, you're mm -hmm. still famous 40 years on in bodybuilding, and right. a lot of the bodybuilders that have won Mr. Universe and MP may never be heard of again. Mm -hmm. How would you contrast 
Well, I would contrast the uh, bodybuilders of my era to be individuals. In other words, when you saw John Grimmick <coughs> walking down the, the street or at the beach, or Clancy Ross, or myself, or Alan Steffen, or other, other boys of that time, other men of that time, you could recognize them from uh, 100 yards away. Nowadays, uh, they all look like they're clones of each other. Some have darker skin, some have lighter hair, and some are taller, some are shorter. That's the difference. They're not individualists anymore. Yeah, and your training philosophy and your your sort of your goals were they always set very very definite in your mind before you set out to your training? Did you have a plan in mind? Oh yes. When I was in the army, from the age of uh, 18 to just a little under 21, I wrote a little book for myself, How to Win Mr. America, and I outlined all the exercises I would use and all all the uh, diets I would go on and and uh, what routines I would use and what lifestyle I would live, all that. So you had it all planned out? Right. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Going mm -hmm. back that far, that was sort of very unusual then. Yes, it was. Because I suppose Schwarzenegger used that later on, even in, when mm -hmm. he was, I spoke to him one time and he said that that's more or less what he did. He, he planned out what he wanted to achieve. Mm -hmm. So you did it that far back and mm -hmm. that's right. you were very, right, very right. successful with it. Mm -hmm. um, your current lifestyle, and including your level of fitness, would you continue to train now? Oh, yes. Now I, I train five days a week, but it's different than before. I uh, do my power walking, you know, weights mm -hmm. on my, in my hands or on my waist and on my ankles. I, I invented power walking. I wrote the book. Uh, I do that every morning for about 45 minutes, followed by a half-hour workout, one strenuous set of about 15 reps for each body part. Then after a while, I, I'm, after that, I might take a swim or do some water exercises. That, that's my routine. And how far would you do the power walking in 45 minutes? How far would you tra travel in that time? Oh, I, I don't really know. Maybe three three miles or five miles. I, I don't I don't really know. Yeah. And again, your diet today would it have changed an awful lot? In there? Well, my breakfast is always the same, but everything else is a little bit less than before. What would you have for breakfast? <clears throat> well, the, the break my secret breakfast is for the last forty years or so, I have about sixteen ounces of orange juice. I put it in a blender, and in that orange juice, I put a banana, two raw eggs about uh, or two or three tablespoons of gelatin, uh, some wheat germ, some bee pollen, and some oatmeal, and some honey. Blend it up together. It's a great tasting drink. Power breakfast. Uh, that's a power breakfast. That, that's a real bomb. And what about mid-morning? Would you have anything then? No. I'll, for, for lunch, I'll just have a sandwich or, and a glass of milk or yogurt or something like that. And for supper, I'll have my main meal of either beef or, or chicken or turkey, mainly chicken and turkey these days. Company by rice or a baked potato and a huge salad. And alcohol? No. Not not r rarely. You know, I'm, I might have a spaghetti dinner with a beer or or a wine or something like that. I, I, I don't say I would have more than we'll say three or four drinks a week, total. Mm -hmm. You're looking very good on that sort of that lifestyle <laughs> and that diet for sure. What about the, the current trends in bodybuilding? I mean, it's becoming nearly chemical warfare as it compared to the way you would uh, have watched your diet and trained very hard. Yeah, that, that's the thing. You see, uh, during my time, I believe that bodybuilding was a health-oriented uh, sport, where now it's, a, it's unhealthy, chemical-induced gains and all that. I, I believe if uh, your genetic background didn't give you the hormones to build the kind of body you wanted without injecting other hormones into your body, you should take up some other sport like, uh, I don't know, catching butterflies, ping pong, or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Would you have ever taken steroids, even if you were available? No, never, then? never, never, because it's not health-oriented. Yeah. I mean, I, I plan to live to be 100. I don't know if I'll make it, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try. And that there w would get me dead at 65, probably. Sure. Well, so many of the bodybuilders now today, the shape, as you said earlier mm -hmm. on, it's just, they all look the same, and they're all humpy, bumpy muscles all over the place. That's right. And there's no nice symmetrical look at all. No, I, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, recommend it. I, I think the magazines have gone all out of their way to sell products and to, in, to uh, encourage people to do the wrong thing instead of the other thing. And instead of saying, uh, let's have a little bit more sy symmetry here, they always said size, size, bigger, bigger is better, you know? Um, I worked for Vince Garanda for a while, and he always said to me that um, any room that, that you were in, he wasn't in. Mm -hmm. And he said when he appeared at, at some show at the Euro, he was hoping that the floor would just open up mm -hmm. and he would just disappear. No, Vince is one of the few people I really respect as far as his knowledge of, of bodybuilding and the right type of physique to build. He really has the knowledge and knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. He's very anti-steroids for oh, sure. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, very and much he's, so. he's strictly for symmetry. Mm. Do you have any comments to make on, on such 
as, as Arnold and Lee Haney and you know, their wins of the Mr. Olympia and the amazing amount of money that seems to be in bodybuilding now. Well, it, it is a new innovation, <clears throat> making money out of bodybuilding. I remember when I came to uh, the Mr. Universe both times, I had to pay my own way across the sea both times and, and stay my hotel and food and, and all those things. Now they pay those guys money in advance just to show mm -hmm. if they win, lose, or draw. Well, there was one bodybuilder who came to Ireland only recently, and before he left the terminal building in the airport, he had to be paid three and a half thousand pounds. He wouldn't leave the airport till he got paid three and a half thousand pounds. No kidding. And he's uh, Mr. Olympia, and mm -hmm. uh, he just refused to move. To move. Mm -hmm. I think the whole the whole attitude of the bodybuilding seems to have changed. Where they're very right. becoming very uh, certainly unhealthy, but their aggressive attitude towards life in general. That's right. That's right. It seems to be really terrible. And like you say, only only a few people can uh, pull down any money to make a living on. You know, you have to have other jobs in life. That's, maybe that's why they're taking the risks they're taking now in regards to taking all these steroids. Maybe, maybe it's not worth it though. And yourself, you seem to be a very private person. In your, we, we've been certainly looking for magazines. Mm -hmm. Every bit of scrap we get in the paper, we keep it in. I keep it in a sort of mm -hmm. a little diary. And uh, you must value your privacy. Very much so. And I, I rarely give interviews and uh, public appearances and things like this. I came over here because Oscar Heidenstein was, was a friend of mine. And uh, I feel uh, a loyalty to England and, and a gratefulness because I won my Mr. Universe contest here. Did you make many friends over here when you uh, were... Quite a few, but you know, a lot of them are, were older than myself and aren't with us anymore, like Oscar. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, did you ever realize, I suppose, the, the importance of, of the, the influence you had on so many people, including myself and, and Tony as well? Uh, like, the influence you had on people was so incredible. Did you ever yourself ever realize that you would have well, such I, an Well, I am realizing it because I get letters today, I mean, many a week, saying that when I was a kid, this and that, and you changed my life, and uh, not only from the States, but from all over the world, mainly England, Germany, Italy, Australia. And how does it make you it, feel? It, it must be something well, special. Well, I mean, it, it, it feels like an achievement. Yeah, right. it sure is an achievement. Right. And the, added, the, the people would have a sort of an impression of you as being Mr. Goody Goody. Is that, would you say that's true? You know, that's just so perfect and the most perfect mm -hmm. body ever. And mm. you look fantastic now as well. And you seem that everything seems to be going so well for you in your life. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what I am and what I've done. Would, would, would you work on that, the things that you're, you're successful with now, even the, in, in your home life and so on? Would you find that that would come across in, your, uh, in everything that you do? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I feel in life I have not lived up to my potential. But that's beside the point. In other words, I didn't want to work that hard to, to gain extra wealth or extra fame and things like that. Whatever fame, wealth, and other things I've achieved, I've done, it hasn't been too hard for me. I wouldn't want to sacrifice a lot of things to achieve that. It wouldn't have been worth it to me. <coughs> I prefer my fri privacy and uh, quiet times, things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be in, in the public eye to, uh, and all the, and innovate, I mean, all the ovation, things like that. Mm. I mean, somebody could tell me I, I was the worst bodybuilder ever lived or the greatest one ever lived. It wouldn't have phased me either way because I know who I am and what I am and how far I've gone and how far I would have liked to have gone. Mm. And do you finally have any, any words of wisdom you'd like to sort of leave us with us in regards to NABA? Would you have any w words of wisdom yourself that you'd like to put across to us? I would say lead a healthy life and uh, don't do anything to extremes. Whether it, it's be, don't be fanatic with your workouts or don't drink a lot, which is negative. That's what, things like that, I would say. And as a person gets older, keep working out, but don't use the same weights. Use lighter weights with more repetitions. And would you just finally move on to, uh, would you recommend aerobic exercise, which people at the moment seem to be going into more than anything else? Mm -hmm. The trend seems to be going... Well, aerobic exercises in, in the uh, form of, we'll say, of cross-country skiing, uh, swimming, power walking, something that isn't going to... Uh, Screw up your joints when you get over a certain age. And where is, the, is your book available, the power walking book? Because I've been looking for it for a long time. Uh, it's no longer in print. Do you intend to reprint? I, I may because I own, I own it now because uh, Bob's Merrill who printed it, I had a contract with them that said if they don't have 500 in their office in Minneapolis, Minnesota at all times, that I could take over. Well, they sold it to uh, uh, another company. I can't think of the company now. And at the time, they lost the plates. So I wrote to him and I said, look, you've broken your contract, the book is back, it's mine. Because then I'd only get, we'll say, 10%, and now if I sold, I'd get 100%. So I may revise it 
and uh, put it back on the market. And just and and send some over to England. And, what, English, and Ireland as well. English, English speaking countries. And Ireland, English speaking countries, right? Have you any plans at any stage ever to travel to Ireland, even for a holiday or anything? Oh, uh, I would like to. I would really like to, <clears throat> because I'm Irish, English, German, and Welsh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I feel I feel quite Irish, especially on St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which was yesterday when I came over. That's true. Yeah. Right. Well, whatever combination that you have. Yeah, I, I'd love to visit Ireland. I really would. Well, we look after you very well when you come over, anyway. That sounds good. And thanks for the few words of wisdom on that. Thank thanks you. Very much thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tony's just going to ask you a few more.